Hi, my name is Jason Stevenson. I'm presenting to you from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. And today I'm going to talk about how to engage potentially resistant faculty to the use of new teaching techniques in your curriculum. I have no disclosures. The objectives for this talk include first, to list the sources of faculty resistance to adoption of novel instructional techniques. Next, to describe the key elements that promote faculty engagement in adoption of these newer teaching techniques. And finally, to explain the critical role of student feedback and iterative improvement in the development of new learning activities. In overview, I'll start, start by talking about the background and we'll discuss some of the sources of this. In addition, I'll move on to talking about the Wisconsin method and how we build trust and engagement in adoption of these new teaching methods. Uh, along the way, I'll stress, stress the importance of building a foundation, recruiting and engaging faculty, and then augmenting uh, their participation with an iterative process, followed by a short summary. At the University of Wisconsin, our efforts in radiology education were initially siloed. Specifically, most of our participation came in the form of a specific dedicated radiology uh, clerkship curriculum. This was a required curriculum at UW, but ultimately we had full reign to implement content in the way that was most effective for us, in the way that was most convenient for us. Over time, changes in curriculum prompted us to have to change to a new model. And that new model incorporated different types of teams uh, within which we worked. Specifically, within the Department of Radiology, various stakeholders that participated in at various different stages of the four-year medical school curriculum in collaboration with other departments so we have courses that we run as a team with internal medicine and with some of the other clinical departments and then courses that exist entirely outside of radiology so some of our faculty are director of courses that uh, that live in other departments and therefore have learning objectives that are tailored towards other aspects of the curriculum and not necessarily inclusive of radiology messages at all. Why change? So for us, the curriculum changed and we had to match that. If we were gonna to continue to have a place of relevance in that curriculum, we were gonna to have to figure out how to collaborate with other partners and, uh, and find ways that we could use radiology to augment existing learning objectives in the new curriculum. Um, but there are other reasons to change. Sometimes the, the learning activities take too much time or are inefficient with time, especially given increasing time constraints for the curriculum as a whole and increasing competing time constraints placed on us by our clinical responsibilities or other administrative responsibilities within the department. Sometimes newer learning activities are better matched for the content than traditional learning activities. And we'll talk about in, a, in just a few, few minutes what the difference between traditional and new really means. Sometimes we need increased flexibility because we need to suit a flexible schedule style or uh, or learners that are distributed in, in time and space, and we need to have a curriculum that can accommodate the needs of those different learners. Um, learning efficiency is important. There are certain activities that are very high in learning efficiency, certain activities are very low in learning e efficiency, and moving towards high efficiency techniques is a good way to maximize the time that you have available with your students. Um, I mentioned accommodating distance learners and the flexibility component. And then institutional mandates. There may be external demands placed on the different settings, uh, the different time frames, the different contexts within which you interact with students. So the newer techniques that we're talking about are generally things that rely on something other than a live lecture format. Um, some of these things rely on technology, so they could be computer modules or online quiz demonstrations or recorded videos, things that in some way engage the digital landscape that we all deal with now. Um, 
Some of these things are non-technology based, meaning they don't really involve an electronic solution, but they mean reconfiguring the students in some activity other than a lecture. A case-based seminar is a good example of this, or something like uh, a small group intensive discussion session uh, in, in, instead of a lecture. Um, motivations for change may be varied and typically are multifactorial. Um, ultimately, though, what we're finding is that at most institutions, there is some, uh, or some motivation to, to change how we teach our students. The sources of resistance can be varied and very complicated as well. Um, on this slide, I list several, um, including lack of familiar, familiarity with techniques and technophobia, which we encounter from time to time. Um, uh, a change from, uh, from established norms or uh, things like that. But there are some specific things on this list that I really want to take some time and delve into in more detail. Number one, lack of familiarity of techniques is, is probably the thing that I see most commonly. Faculty uh, who are currently practicing are more likely to have learned the majority of the content that they acquired during their medical school training uh, during a lecture. Uh, during residency, most of what we learned in the didactic space took place in the form of a lecture. As a result, this is the medium that we're most comfortable with implementing. And as such, adopting new techniques would require some sort of introduction to these techniques, some increased familiarity with these techniques. And so the lack of that familiarity is a, is a very big roadblock that we encounter commonly. Um, there's a high upfront cost to converting a lecture that you already have created and have already done and have some expertise with to some newer format that's a it's a it's a very much a step out into the unknown uh, that leaves many faculty feeling uh, with feelings of insecurity about that process and that feeling is completely normal and completely natural and should be expected when we're asking people to really try to wrap their mind around these new things depending on your institutionals your, sorry, excuse me, your institution's compensation structure, you may find that um, changing from a face-to-face -face lecture to a recorded uh, video lecture ends up reducing your contact time with students as recorded by your institution. And that may have some, you know, some implication as to how much credit you receive for that iteration. Um, and, uh, and how much remuneration your department or you specifically receive as a result of your participation in the MD curriculum. Um, and, and that compensation structure uh, can be very dicey. That could potentially be fatal limitation of your ability to adopt new practices. This is something that educators share with me quite a bit when they're concerned about switching their content to something that's entirely online and thereby writing themselves out of relevance uh, in, in terms of the curriculum at their institution. So this is an important concern and it really has to be considered in designing a strategy to move to new, uh, to new, new teaching techniques. In addition, career advancement concerns could also be related to these as credit for lecture can be different than credit for creating uh, a a recorded lecture that lives in perpetuity outside of the ongoing participation of that faculty member. So working out how this credit uh, is, um, is applied is an important part of this process. Um, really more broadly, there's a specific set of policy uh, constraints that can really affect how easy it is to adopt newer teaching techniques, especially those that involve the digital space and online content for remote learners. So how do we do it? And this is what I call winning hearts and minds. Convincing folks that this is something that we should do requires, in my experience, three specific steps. Each of these steps is important and diminishing any one of them could leave you at a disadvantage when it comes to recruiting faculty. The first is foundation building. 
then there's the cell, and finally augmentation and iteration. So foundation building is exactly what it sounds like. Building, putting in place the tools upon which these new curricula will rest. Um, this involves an incredible amount of planning and foresight, but if done well, this can really facilitate some nice innovation and ease your faculty in adopting these new methods. Specifically, putting together teams of people who can help your faculty uh, convert their learning activities into a different format. Um, having the available hardware and software to perform that conversion, having uh, personnel on hand that specifically understand how to use those materials in order to make that change, which could include support personnel, um, uh, but it could also be the faculty themselves. Support personnel are helpful in, 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 in accomplishing any, any scheduling needs or performing any clerical tasks that may need to happen in converting one thing to another format. Uh, the policy framework that I mentioned on the prior slide is critical. So thinking about the policy implications of moving to remote learning opportunities um, is, is important. And sometimes part of foundation building is really performing policy related advocacy within your institution to try to change or update or revise rules to advantage faculty who participate in this innovative space. Uh, similarly, thinking about the career development implications. So if there are rules of promotion that don't favor faculty who cr are creating things uh, using these newer techniques, uh, those policies uh, it would be helpful to begin thinking about how to change those policies or figuring out who to talk to or who to put pressure on in order to make that change happen. So there's a really big advocacy piece to creating this foundation, as well as a literal gathering of various resources. Next comes the cell. And this is the conversation that you have with colleagues to try to convince them to take their, uh, their traditional learning activity and convert that into a newer learning activity. This role, uh, when I first conceived of it, thought I thought of that as, as, as kind of a, you know, an advisor. I would come in and tell them what they needed to do, and then I would walk away, and at some point later they would present me with a product. What I've come to understand is that that advisory role is much more involved than you would initially think, specifically because of all the anxiety, the apprehension, the concerns, the distrust that's related to um, some of those issues on a prior slide that are, that are, that are limitations and hindrances to adopting these methods. Um, it takes time and it takes a very personal approach sometimes to get faculty over that hump, get them into that realm of the unknown or to step off the cliff, as it were. Um, what you'll find really, there's a range of comfort levels with making that leap. On one hand, you may have faculty that you describe to them the new activity, say, got it, they walk off into the distance and they come back with a you know, expert level, very polished product. Others need to have the, the constraints explained, to have the backstory filled in, to establish exactly how this is going to help students. And, and, it, and it's helpful if you have at your fingertips the answers to those questions, but also you invite that faculty member to participate in an ongoing conversation about how we are going to approach these uh, these. Uh, transitions. And that requires lots of patience, lots of understanding, and really trying to put yourself in the in the shoes of a faculty member who is um, being asked to develop content in a space where, where he or she may not really feel comfortable um, developing. Um, reassuring them that, in fact, they do have the skills as an educator to participate in that space, uh, and then connecting them to the resources that were listed in the prior section as you built the foundation. An example of this would be if I'm going to ask a faculty member to record a lecture, um, I'm going to then help them get their slides into the appropriate format, get them onto into a workstation where we can perform that recording, so a sufficiently equipped workstation, 
and then give them tips about how to make these recordings, how we can edit the, the uh, recorded uh, lecture, and what kind of augmentation we can do to the presentation that will give the learner an advantage in, uh, in onboarding that information. It's helpful to identify the goals, to talk about the strengths and weakness, weaknesses of the faculty, and be very realistic about reconciling those things. Um, it is possible that certain faculty are not well suited to cert for certain types of learning activities. Um, and you may not have the liberty to perfectly tailor each faculty to the context that they within which they work the best. But to the extent that there's discordance, it's helpful to acknowledge that and be very transparent about that fact and develop a plan to, uh, to help ease that transition. Um, it's helpful also to that purpose to demonstrate these techniques. So one of the things that I've done in the past is if I have a faculty, I want them to create a learning module or start to design a learning module, I will present the invitation to do that learning module in the form of a learning module so that I'm demonstrating how to use these actual techniques. Or if, if someone else has created a learning module, I'll make sure that they have that as a reference to understand exactly what that looks like. Um, finally, it's helpful to offer support as much as you can. And again, going back to the first bullet point, sometimes that's counseling. Sometimes that's, that's really sitting with them and, and talking about it. Other times it may be trying to bring in other people with expertise or giving them collaborators in order to help, uh, help ease that burden. Now, these are some additional ideas that you can include as you craft your appeal. First of all, a face-to-face -face appeal is optimal. Um, it's much easier to convince people to do things uh, about which they're uncomfortable if you're standing in front of them, receptive to answering any question and any questions that they have and addressing any concerns that they may present to you. Um, bridging the gap between their comfort zone and your target is key. So what are the steps that, that can get that person in line, walking down the path towards creating this new uh, learning activity and, and helping them and guiding them, potentially holding their hand down that path? Aligning priorities is important. And for most educators, considering the benefits of the learners uh, can be very helpful. So many of these techniques have uh, validated improvements in learner um, engagement learning efficiency and durability of knowledge. So in the end, these are things that are actually helping learners. And, and most of us as educators are, are really all oriented down that path. So really reminding faculty of that is a good way to get everyone's priorities in line. Um, acknowledging limitations and being very frank about limitations is, is, is uh, another important point really to help you uh, address and help you be receptive to the to the uh, uh, concerns of your faculty. Um, finally, this process really represents a tightening of the curricular structure and and is an opportunity to make all of your activities uh, more closely reflective of the learning objectives for those activities or potentially in line with other larger uh, institutional priorities. The last step is augmentation and iteration. As with the other steps, patience and perseverance are very important here. Really what we wanna do is get the learning activity into existence and then recognize that that is not the end of the story. Augmentation and iteration all happens after this activity has deployed for the first time. Managing expectations is a really important part of that process. Helping faculty understand before they've really started to develop that activity that it may take three or four iterations um, before some sort of comfort level is really achieved with that activity. It may take three or four iterations before some of the major flaws are revealed and the, and the activity really takes on a more mature form. And that is expected, that should be expected, so patients in this process really involves getting everyone into a shared understanding around the fact that we are in this for the long haul. And we really have to be open-minded, non-judgmental as we approach improving this in an ongoing basis. Um, to that end, 
candid feedback from learners is key, That bo both in written anonymous form, but here at UW, we really like to encourage face-to-face -face feedback also. We encourage learners to be thinking about how to tear our learning activities apart and really giving us really candid, hard-hitting um, feedback about how to improve. We find that engaging learning this, learners in this way helps us align the pieces of our curriculum in a way that, that matches their, uh, their preferred learning styles. Um, this also creates opportunities to share your experience with other experiences with other educators and create a local community of content providers where people can exchange tips and things that maybe you didn't uh, didn't have as part of your initial pitch, something that they learn along the way they can share with other people and that can be very helpful. Um, to that end, mourning lost roles and abandoned activities. Sometimes a new role means an old role that went away for someone and giving them time and space to accept that loss and to move on can be an important part of this process, especially as you iterate with each iteration that new role becomes more comfortable and becomes something that feels more natural to them. Uh, and then finally, affirmation and acknowledgement is an important part of this process, really thanking those people that took that blind leap off that cliff uh, on behalf of your students and your curriculum is an important part of the process. So in summary, uh, the sources of resistance in, uh, in, in creating new curricular opportunities and new teaching techniques, uh, employing new teaching techniques are numerous. Um, a solid foundation makes for an easier ask and a better resourced teacher is going to be in a better position to meet the students' needs. Um, setting expectations is an important part of this process. Patience and counseling is another important part of this process. And making clear the expectation that we're not expecting immediate success. This is an iterative process and takes some, uh, some trial and error to really get just right. Gathering feedback and continuing uh, continual support throughout that process is a really important part of uh, providing that ongoing support um, and continual improvement. All right, so that's that's all I have. Uh, please uh, follow our education group on Twitter at, uh, at UW underscore radiology underscore ed, uh, or follow me and my personal account at JW underscore Stevenson. Um, thank you very much.